as always, I want to thank not only uh, Michael for asking me to uh, be a part of the lectures, but also thank the elders and, of course, uh, the congregation. The work that you have done here over the years uh, has just been fantastic and always appreciate the opportunity to come. Uh, with regard to uh, England, you know, Michael has been over there once, and he, he told me, he said, you know, I was fully prepared to hate it. <clears throat> but then he told me he liked it. I said, well, then we have to see if we can get you back over here. That's when he fell to the excuse, using his wife as an excuse. <laughs> That's how that started. So um, I keep trying to encourage Karen, whom I know is not a fan of, of airplanes. So, um, We'll have to redirect one of those slow boats that was going to China. The other day I was eating with Gene Hill, and, and Gene was he was saying, "Well, from California, he says, says he says this just must seem like a completely different place to you, doesn't it? It's like a different world." I said, "Yes, Gene. If you if you knew what it was like." in the Bay Area, it would seem like a different world to you, too. And so every once in a while, some of the fellows will, will say, oh, and, and I have mentioned this before, and I, I won't mention it ever again, so I hope you all get, get close. Uh, people here in other parts of the country think of uh, Jerry Brown and, and Nancy Pelosi as being really nutty and, and left-wing, which they are. But they are to the right of most of every other person in California. <laughs> so just, just to give you an idea, but we are, we are, we are glad to be here uh, today, always. Uh, and the lesson for this, this morning, of course, uh, coming from 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'd like to read the verses 14 through 18. <clears throat> Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God a word when it needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Idea for the lectures centering around standards. And we become quite familiar with standards in various areas of life. We think of the various seals of approval. We think of the good housekeeping seal. We think of, uh, perhaps in some instances, uh, consumer reports. We think of the gold standard, the idea of a standard. And the standard, of course, as we look at it from the context of the, of the lesson here, that which says, show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right providing the word of truth. There we see a standard, a standard that has been set, and it is one that we, we come to asking a question. And the question would be, what should we expect? What should be expected? We look at this text, what should be expected of a minister of the gospel? And it's a question that when we look at this, this question here, every preacher, every evangelist, every teacher should ask himself, what should we expect? Paul is talking to Timothy or writing to Timothy under the influence of God here, but certainly also every congregation should consider uh, this as they evaluate the support for the evangelists. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, when we look at the text here, we find the qualities of a worker. A worker expected to adhere to certain standards. And we will get a little bit more, more about the idea of the worker in terms of a, of a labor. 
But the scripture, as we look at this, this tells us who is approved of God. And I think just looking at this here, you look at that question, who is approved of God? Study to show thyself approved unto God, meeting a standard that is set by God. And the person who is approved of God, and this came through in some of the lessons last night, yesterday, a person who is approved by God is a person who does not mishandle the word of God. Who does not twist it to fit what we think or what we want it to say or overemphasize certain portions and underemphasize others who take away from what God has said. This scripture tells me that any person who mishandles the word of God is not approved of God. And when we look at this, and some of the main points that are in the verse here, if we want God's approval, not just preachers, if any of us want God's approval, then if we want to be accepted of God, acceptable to God, we must study, be diligent, and be true teachers of his word. It says does not need to be ashamed. The workman who studies God's word, the workman who diligently studies, who puts effort, earnestly, sincerely looking into God's word to unearth its treasures, to find out what it is that God is saying, not only to us individually, but to other people as well. Who correctly analyze and accurately divide, rightly dividing that word, handling it skillfully, effectively. That faithful Christian who will not be ashamed when he faces the Lord in the day of judgment. As is mentioned before, boldly approaching the throne of grace. When I read that verse, that's what I'm thinking about. So what is it that they're saying here? I'll begin a little bit with verse 14. And there we are told to put brethren in remembrance. Someone who reminds the brethren, as Paul did, over in Romans chapter 15 and verse 15, when he wrote his epistle there, as, as he spoke to the brethren, as putting you in mind. When he sent Timothy to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways. My, my ways, really, as Paul is saying that, he's talking about the standard that I try to live up to, and he says, in my ways, the standard that I hope you live up to, which be in Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 6. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that is a standard that is being established, that is in thee. We can also see in the writing of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, when he knew that his death was imminent. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. So when he is writing, put them in remembrance in verse 14. We see the evidence of that, not just here, but in other places as well. And also Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. I write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken. Mindful of the words spoken. The standard that was established by the holy prophets. The commandments of us the apostles. So when, when reading this particular set of verses, they're not isolated at all. But they're actually referenced in certain ways by many other of the brethren throughout the scriptures. Jude himself reminding them of things they already knew. Jude 1, 5. 
reminding them of the dangerous influence of ungodly men, Jude 3 and 4, 1, 3 and 4. And the thing about this, the idea of remembrance, and this is, this is to some degree, it's a little bit humorous, because repetition is quite necessary, isn't it? It's quite necessary. You're not going to be able to open up the Bible and find any new chapters. You're not going to be able to open up the Bible and, and, and find a new episode. You're going to find things there that have been there for years and God put them there. So to the members of the congregation, don't get upset with the preacher. Don't get upset for them telling you things you say, I already know. Don't get upset because it's good for you. It's good for us. It's good for us when we go over material over and over and over again, sifting through, finding out new ideas or, or new ways to approach it. I would hope that every preacher here says something all the time that is not only something that's repetitive, but essential and necessary. Repent. Put them in remembrance of the need to repent. He also says here, charging them before the Lord in verse 14, not only reminding them, but also charging them. Paul charged the brethren concerning their spiritual growth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. How ye ought to walk, so ye would abound more and more. Commanding them to withdraw from orderly brethren. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. We command you, we charge you to withdraw yourselves. Paul did the same with Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 21, to observe things without partiality, to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge thee. We're talking about reaching the standards that God has set and sprinkled throughout the scriptures that is the responsibility of every Christian. Now here we sit in the context of Paul talking to Timothy, writing to Timothy. But this is exactly what the expectation is for every Christian, really. And as long as what is being charged is from God's Word. And again, brethren, don't get upset with preachers and teachers for commanding you to do something. That is from the scriptures. A lot of times they'll probably say, hey, well, I just don't like the way that preacher said. I don't like that. I don't care if it is. Basically what they're saying is, I don't care if it is in the Bible. I don't like him telling me that. And I think that that's the, the attitude many people have. They just don't understand that the responsibility that he is, we see it, the preacher has, and every Christian really, is that responsibility to, as he says here, put us in remembrance and charge them with regard to their responsibilities and our responsibilities. And a worker who is approved unto God shows a particular, uh, a particular type of diligence. Hebrews chapter 4, verses, chapter 4, verse 1, and also verse 11. Lest they fall short of their heavenly rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall out of the same example. How many times have preachers used that verse? Let us labor. What's involved in labor? There's a certain degree of diligence. To make their calling and election sure, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. To be found in the Lord, to be diligent, to be found in the Lord, in peace, without spot, and blameless. That requires work, and that work is to meet a certain standard. Now people, of course, want to change the standards. It's just like in the education system, they want to lower the standards. As a matter of fact, that's what we're involved in, in in this cultural war that we find in our country today. Every opportunity to lower the standard. I think it started in Little League. 
where you couldn't you couldn't win in fifteen to one anymore. You know, they had to stop the game and, and let the other team bat extra times to get some runs. And so now, no matter what it is, you see there's a lowering of standards. And especially, we, we see here the importance on keeping the standard where God set it. When we look at uh, over in, in, in the charge that was given to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. And there, of course, Timothy was charged to give attention to doctrine. Attention to doctrine. And he was commanded to take heed to the doctrine. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Doctrine is the standard. And we know from experience that people want to get away from doctrine. Or they have a negative view of doctrine. Or they want to eliminate doctrine. They want everything to be a result of emotion or feelings or the current trends. Idea behind that word study or be diligent, meaning to exert oneself, to make an effort, to endeavor. All of those with regard to the Word of God. On the way over here, I was talking with Gene, and we we're talking about the many times that we encourage people, and I'm sure all of you do, encouraging people to read the Bible. Read the Bible every day. Why would you not read the Bible? What else is more important in your life than giving a little bit of time in your, your mind to focus, refocus on what God requires of us? We want to be with him for eternity. And that word of God must be handled properly. It must be, as it says, rightly divided. There are so many different ways that it has been translated, divided uh, properly. And, and so when we think about how do we handle the word of God properly, it means we are not to teach our own ideas, the theories of other people, what we think, or what other people think. We teach what God has revealed. And that is our responsibility. To meet the standard that God set by teaching exactly what he said. And not being ashamed to say it exactly as he says it. And many times, or a few times, I, I will mention that I am so glad that what I'm reading to the people or speaking uh, at the congregation about, I, I would say I am so glad that I'm just reading this right out of the Bible. So if you want to argue with someone, argue with God. Because you're not arguing with me. And so when we handle God's word properly, correctly, we look at it, preach it, and teach it, exactly as it's revealed on the pages of the scripture. And of course you have the hermeneutic component to it that's certainly interpreting it properly so that others may understand it exactly as God wants it understood. And when we think about these, these things, people also want to ask, you know, well, how do you know that that's right? And then you go through the process of explaining things. That's why... Generally, I like the expository style of preaching. It just goes right down the scripture. And they can read it. They can see it in the context. And here, this is, this is what we look at. That's what we're looking at here. Different ways of translating it, cutting it straight, cutting it the straight way, proceed down the right path, straight course, doing it right. All of those ideas are pretty similar, pretty easy to understand. And even in the various translations of it, and, and even the NIV says correctly handles the word of truth. That's ironic almost, isn't it? 
You go over to the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11. It says, "Those were more noble. Uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind." Now, that is what every preacher looks for on Sunday morning, isn't it? People who are ready to receive the word with all readiness of mind. That's the way that we are preparing ourselves in the morning. That's the way we prepare ourselves Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, so that when we get to worship on Sunday morning, whether it's the Bible class and then the sermon, we are ready to receive the word of God with all readiness in mind. Not coming in yawning, tired, up too late on Saturday night. And search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. I think it was Brother Smith last night, if I recall. I may get this incorrect, and of course he can correct me. Where he made a couple of quotes, and I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, where he used a different word that was found in there to see it. I don't know if he was doing that to see if we were keeping up with him through the scriptures or not. But I think that most preachers ask that you read along with them in your Bibles. Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Feed the flock. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Be of a ready mind. Handling accurately God's word. What does that include? What's included in that? The idea, of course, of understanding both the Old and New Testaments. Matthew 13, verse 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasures new and old. Distinguishing between the old and new covenants. Remembering that meat is for the mature and milk is for the babes. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. We know that in certain circumstances, you're going to preach and teach a certain way depending on the audience and, and that this will shift and change again depending on the people with whom you're teaching. You're going to teach the same truth, but the way that you approach it will depend on the audience to whom you're speaking. Bearing in mind, in some instances, as Paul himself said, some instances, you're going to deal with people who are carnal. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There, Paul saying, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Ye are yet carnal. So that's going to require a different approach. Your method is going to be a little different. Now, Paul, as he's writing here to Timothy, he says, shun profane and vain babblings. Now, I have to tell you the honest truth. When I went back over that yesterday, the person who came to mind was Brother Daniel. When he says there, verses 16 through 18, shun profane and vain babblings. Their word will eat as doth a canker, who concerning the truth of air, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You look at that. He's talking about these various conversations that you, sometimes you just have to have. It came up in the open forum, the idea of whom to debate or not to debate. And when it comes to those who are striving about words to no profit, many times Brother Denham has to enter into that ring. Fight that battle. Verse 16. That's what it's talking about. These profane and idle babblings that come out of the mouth of some. 
And I think the brotherhood should be very thankful to Brother Denham for doing that. Because the conversations that he's had to engage in, the debates that he's had to engage in for the defense of the gospel have been an attempt to dislodge those who have brought ruin to their hearers. Which ultimately leads to more ungodliness. I think this was part of what Brother Smith was talking about yesterday evening. And here, of course, Paul, as we have the right and expectation to do, called out the names of those false teachers. And of course, our society today wants to be very politically correct. And we don't really want to hurt feelings. And so it's, it's, it's generally... Uh, considered in better taste now not to call out people by their names. But that's almost unscriptural. Paul here says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus? And I think when we come in contact with false teachers, we, you have to mark them, you have to let people know who they are, you have to know with whom they should not be in fellowship, you need to let your congregations know, you need to let neighboring congregations know that you're in fellowship with. Anyone who's a false teacher needs to be identified, publicized. We were talking about this this morning on the way in. Brother Gene Hill and I were talking about the beginning of Crossroads and how when Lucas went, I believe, from Miami to Gainesville, if I understand it correctly, and again, if I'm incorrect, Brother Gene Hill, the next opportunity, he will correct me. But how when Chuck Lucas left from Miami and went to Gainesville, that the elders, if I understand it correctly, in Miami didn't say anything. He just went there, and they thought, oh, we have a new member. These things should not be so. And when we, over the last several years, and this, is, this has been, and I want to commend Brother Hatcher and, and all of you who have been engaged in writing about these various instances recently, in the last 10 years or so anyway, where false teachers have tried to spread false doctrine. Now, if we're going to here be a worker that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, then the exposure of false teaching, whether it's Dave Miller, whether it's Mac Deaver, whether it's the 80s, 70s, whether it's... it's uh, I don't have time for all those names, do I? But it goes back and it, it reminds me of how much to appreciate Brother Ira Rice. And how he would, he would just pound it. And the brethren would be so upset. Oh, Brother Rice, you, you, you shouldn't be doing this. You're calling out names. But if you don't know that there's a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, it might be too late when you find out. And so Paul here, when he writes to Timothy, and he, and he tells him even earlier, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith to do so do. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved, having swerved, have turned aside under vain jangling. God has set a standard. And he tells us not to be obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, useless wranglings of men and corrupt minds, destitute of truth, over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. 
If any man teach otherwise and not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which was according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising. Heard that word around recently. Evil surmisings. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. Now that is a phrase right there that so ably identifies many false teachers. Destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Now the Bible tells us how to live. Each and every day. Over in 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings, oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some profess have erred concerning the faith. You know, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That deposit, that word of truth, that word that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. That which we are not to be ashamed of. Because we have handled the word of God properly. We've done what we have been committed to do. As we look also at Paul's writing to Titus. He says pretty much the same thing. Avoid foolish disputes. Contentions and strivings about the law. Those things are unprofitable and useless. This goes back to what Michael was mentioning. Uh, I think it was Michael yesterday. How much do I? Nine? Oh, eight minutes. <laughs> Michael said, with some people, you don't waste your time. I think that's the way he feels when we look at those Facebook forums unprofitable and useless in some instances. But as we come to look at this again, pulling back a bit from it, with so much error, with so much false doctrine in the world, the preacher of the gospel has to walk a particular line. You go back to this text, study to show thyself approved unto God. How do we do that? Where do we position ourselves so that we need not be ashamed when we see the Lord in the day of judgment? We're not ashamed of the work that we have done. We may boldly approach that throne of grace. Paul talks about it, several different illustrations about running the race. About fighting the fight? Have our lives met the standard that God has set before us? Have we done all that we could do? That's what Paul is talking about here with Timothy. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Making sure that as we preach it and teach it to others, that we have spent the time, the effort, the energy necessary to transmit that message of eternal salvation in such a way that every person understands specifically what God requires of them in order to be saved. That is our, you know, we talk about it in the, in the, in the culture, the, the duty of the policeman, the duty of the fireman, the duty of, of the men in the military, how they understand their responsibilities. When there's a fire, they go. Our responsibility and attitude should be even more urgent. The fireman pulls people out of a dangerous situation. The Christian does so with more eternally at stake. I don't know much about Pensacola, 
But I know that here, just as in San Mateo and in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are millions of people whose homes are on fire. And they need to be pulled out with the gospel. That means that we must be very diligent in our use of the word to remind and charge the brethren of the responsibilities that they have. You know, in a very simple way, we think about how do we... We put up sheets in the building, sheets of paper on the wall. These are your responsibilities in the building. You take out the trash, you clean the window seals, you do this, you do that. We remind people of what we have for the fellowship meals. What is the theme? We remind the brethren, not only on the wall, but even in the bulletin. What are your responsibilities in the service, in the worship? You're leading prayers, you're leading singing, and still you have people come up and ask, what am I supposed to do? We have to continually remind and be reminded ourselves. Charging the brethren. And in, in doing so, careful in handling the word of God. With those who are spiritually immature, with those who, with, with those who are in error. Well, the member of the congregation in San Mateo, and if she's watching, I don't really care. That's all right. She's pretty hard knocks when it comes to telling people what they should do. And if she meets you for the very first time, she's going to tell you right then that you need to obey the gospel. She's not going to beat around the bush and you know, wait until it gets all nice and flowery. She's going to tell you right then, you're not a Christian, you need to be saved. Now, there are other ways to do it. You can, you know. But people have to know. People have to know what they have to do for salvation. And this is a responsibility that we have that is unavoidable. If you have a person who knows you. Now, this is not Paul's charge to Timothy. If you have a person that knows you, knows what you like, knows where you go, knows all those things about you, maybe it's the person at the, at the checkout stand. At some point in time, we all have a responsibility to engage that person with the gospel. I'm talking about you and me. How long do we need to know anyone before we let them know what they need to do for eternal salvation? I think Michael's going to speak to Gene Hill about that in a little bit. And so with the aid of these various epistles that, that are written to Timothy and Titus, it is possible for them, for us, to present ourselves approved unto God. It's possible. To be workers who do not need to be ashamed because we put in the effort to rightly divide the word of truth. The gospel is fit for everyone. It's for the software engineer. It's for the farmers. It's for the electricians. It's for every range of occupations. There's no one too smart for the gospel. And there's no one beneath it. And so may those who preach and teach be mindful of these things. And may those of us who do teach and preach encourage others to be mindful as well. Every time I look at this verse, it speaks to me of the responsibility that not only Paul lays out before Timothy, but before all of us, and I take it personally. 
and I think you should as well. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, exposition of that section of Scripture. And calling out people by name, it doesn't make sense, does it, to say if there's a snake that's poisonous that's about to bite you, to say, you know, there, there might be some danger around someplace. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is or what you should do, but I just thought you should know how stupid that is. <laughs> Uh, of course call them by name. We need to know them. It says to mark the doctrine. No, it mark them. It's individuals that teach the doctrine. And since he called out Gene Hill before the session, he was talking about he getting here late because Gene had to take him to Cracker Barrel and eat breakfast and and paid for it too. More than one way. <laughs> but but uh, on the way in, they had some people there opening the doors for them, and Gene had to talk to stop and talk to every one of them. So I asked John, well, did he invite every one of them to the lectures? And Johnny kind of gets this blank look on his face, like he didn't want to answer, but he said no. Uh, well, why not? <laughs> Jane, you're going to have to answer for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had to get Johnny here. <laughs> A couple of other things that, uh, before we dismiss, uh, mention Ira Rice and the wonderful work he did in exposing people. There's one big difference, though, between then when our brother Rice was doing that great work and now. Brother Rice could say, here's what someone did. And everyone would know that it was wrong. Now then you say the same thing. Here's what they did. And everyone says, well, what's wrong with that? We have become ignorant of God's word and how it applies. They knew when Brother Rice pointed it out, that's wrong. Now they might not have liked it. And some all tried to avoid it, but people knew that those things were wrong. Today they don't. We're dealing with a brotherhood that is ignorant of God's word and what's right and what's wrong today. And so today it's not simply pointing out this is, this is what they did, which was sufficient then, you've got to go back and explain and start dealing with, here's why this is wrong. And the problem with that many times is that brethren have lost a respect for God's word as being the authority. And so you can even start pointing out, here's how God's word applies to this, and there's no authority for this. So, it has no effect upon them, because we've lost respect for God's word. And then, the idea that's in the text, words to no profit, if they come, well, all of these things are words to no profit. They don't matter. And we ought to shun those things, uh, talking about them, because they're word, even though they're dealing with the souls of man. To some people, talk about baptism for remission of sins. Well, that's words to no profit. 
they don't understand what that really means. But we appreciate the lesson, Brother Johnny, and reminding of these things. We're going to stand dismiss for about seven minutes now.